and I'm going to present you uh, the work entitled uh, Very High Cycle Fatigue Behavior of S690 uh, Structural Steel. This work was developed by me and my colleagues that you can see here, and I'm from the University of Berlin. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to present you my topics of this presentation. I will start to introduce you to the background and main goals, then I will do some material characterization, and then finally the main topic, the cycle fatigue, and I will uh, approach some, some important topics as frequency effect and notch effect, and then final conclusions and future work. So, first of all, I think it's always, always important to define uh, the main uh, topic of this presentation. I think that uh, the main part of you already know the different regions of uh, fatigue. We normally have here the low cycle region between 10 uh, to 4 and 10 to, to 5. Obviously, these kind of boundaries can be discussed. Uh, then we have high cycle fatigue region here uh, between 10.5 and 10.7 and we are going to study here the region be, uh, be, behind uh, 10 to, to 7. Uh, and usually we study this region here, low cycle and high cycle region. However, maybe around the 80s, uh, some researchers started to uh, feel the need to characterize the region of very high cycle fatigue because we can have some structures that during their severance life experience this kind of number of cycles. Uh, therefore, the main goals of this work is to characterize the very high cycle fatigue uh, behavior of a structural steel that is usually uh, used in offshore structures and then to study the frequency effect and not, not sensitivity. Uh, so, about characterization, we started by characterizing this material because, as you are going to see, it's important to design our specimens. We have presented some samples, and you can see here the microstructure that is almost smarter seed and we also measure the bigger sadness because it's also going to be important to estimate our range of evaluation. Well, about the gigacycle fatigue. Here I have our setup. We have a Shimazu SF2000. Uh, it's an ultrasonic machine. Usually this kind of uh, machines have the same components. We have a wave generator, then we have a piezoelectric transistor that is going to transform the electric wave into a mechanical wave, a booster that is going to amplify it, and a, oh, sorry, and also a heart. And then you can see here our specimen. We need to monitor our temperature and also to cool it uh, because of the high frequency. The sometimes the specimen can overheat. So we also have here a cooling system, and then you can see, can see also here a strain gauge that we use to uh, control and verify our stresses. Uh, this is a very interesting machine because it works in a different principle than a, a, a hydraulic machine. It um, made the specimen to vibrate at the resonance frequency of our machine, so we need to design it to vibrate at 20 kilohertz. Uh, one limitation of this machine is that, is that it, it only can uh, perform uh, tests at stress ratio minus one. So here you have, I have the main methodology that we follow uh, to design our specimens. As usually we, have, we do for every kind of fatigue test, we firstly we estimate the stress range of interest. You can see here our estimation. Of course, that we also have to think about the frequency effect that we are in effect we observed, and then we have a first iteration of, based on an analytical approach that that is already well known and it was de developed by, by Batius, and then we also developed a finite element model to verify it, but of course at the end we need to verify it, verify, verify, verify it experimentally. So, you can see here, here the numerical formulation and the main geometry of our specimens. Here you can see our numerical model that will uh, reproduce um, okay, I have here a video but it's not working. Uh, that can reproduce our uh, experimental test. As you can see here, we have the magma stress here at, uh, at the center, and we also uh, verified our analytical approach. Of course, that's, we need to manufacture our specimens, and this point is very critical because uh, any defect at the surface would initiate the crack, so we needed to polish our specimens, and we also measure the roughness. 
And then we performed our experimental campaign. You can see here our, our data. We have a large scatter and a large dispersion. And as you can see here, for this kind of steel, we have a very uh, horizontal asymptote, asymptote uh, curve. Uh, in fact, one thing that I forgot to mention that is usually in very high cycle fatigue, we can observe some internal initiation. But in our case, most of the cracks were uh, at the surface. As you can see here, we have a very typical surface for this kind of test that we perform. But we, in a single specimen, we observe here an internal detect where the crack started. Uh, so after that, we decided to also uh, analyze and test some large specimens. We are at the beginning. At this point, we don't have exactly a SM curve yet. But I will explain you um, our procedure to uh, design this kind of specimens, we needed to develop also analytical uh, approach. For this case, it's more difficult because this kind of uh, notch specimen is very difficult to approximate it to one, di one direction, one uh, dimension uh, problem. So, in fact, this, this uh, analytical approach can give us a first iteration for our geometry, and we observe that we need to tune the final length. Uh, uh, through our finite element model that you can see here. So as first step, we use this formulation that is based on the wave theory of propagation, and we can calculate the main properties, the notch, and then we need to tune the length of the specimen to test it. Another critical point was the definition of the stress concentration factor. Usually, we define it as the as the the dividing our maximum stress here by the nominal stress. However, the problem is the nominal stress. Since in this kind of machine, we cannot measure the, any loading here at this part because it works based on the displacement. Therefore, we decided to estimate it by uh, an average of the stress here in this section. And we also, for this kind of um, geometry, we have a, a stress concentration factor of 1.50. So at this point, we were uh, able to verify our uh, numerical and analytical approach. In order to that, we put some extension, some strength gauge. You can see here the first one that is at the notch, but for this one, we have a problem that is the deformation of the strength gauge. So we decided to glue a second one here at the cylindrical part because through the numerical model, we can uh, estimate. Uh, calculate here the stresses and compare it with the experimental results. You can see here our measurements and our error between the experimental and finite element uh, results. So for this first one, we already had some good results. We have a very small error, but we at certain levels of stre uh, stress, we start to have some uh, more significant errors. So we decided to uh, introduce this second strain gauge and for this one you can see that our error is quite good. So at this point we, with this kind with this setup we can validate our uh, our formulation and also for this kind of specimens we had to polish and be very careful with the surface. Well I think that in the next present next time I will be able to maybe to show a ISM curve. Um, and then we also uh, have conducted a, um, a study on the frequency effect for this kind of material. We had the opportunity to test this material for in a different kind of machine, in a resonance machine that works. It will depend on the specimen, but for our material, it works at 150 hertz. Uh, that's a bit lower than 20 kilohertz. And, uh, and then we, for, you can see here the results for the 150 and 20 kilohertz, and here this this, uh, this curve is a bit lower than this one, so we can see here that for this kind of material we have some frequency effect. However, this is not very surprisingly. We have a lot of uh, authors and the other research works that show this kind of phenomenon, and it actually depends a lot on the material. So you can see here for this for uh, for this this work uh, on um, um, low carbon steel that we can observe a huge effect of the frequency. And for this case, it, it, that is for a, another steel, the effect is not so huge, but you can also see here, the, uh, the for high frequencies, the curve is going to be a bit 
upper tank for lower frequencies. Uh, we expect in the future to be able to uh, model this uh, frequency effect, or uh, at least try to apply or develop a model that can account for this. We also expect to uh, to obtain an SM curve for the notch effect and to quantify this notch effect. So it's all. Um, Do you have any questions? Thank you for a very nice and interesting presentation. Questions? Okay. Uh, um, question. You showed, uh, um, you showed a slide uh, with the SM curves, I guess it was on the previous 14th. Uh, anyway, yeah. um, it seems to me that maybe you explained, but I missed uh, <laughs> your point. It seems to me that there is a lag scatter yes. in the data. Have you an explanation for this, especially for the smooth specimen? For the, this is for both of the specimens are smooth, but this is for a 20 kilowatts frequency in an ultrasonic machine, and this one is on the more conventional machine at 150 kilo, 50 hertz. This is for the same steel. Uh, we are not sure. We think that maybe is something here for this material. Um, we don't have exactly. We are in the region between the field time and runout. And we observe this kind of difference because we are very careful about the polishing in every specimen and our uh, machining process is very careful because of this because it's going to have a huge impact. Uh, so they are from our test in a very uh, controlled conditions. But we achieved this, for example, for 520 we have uh, a lot of different number of cycles. We have here run out and here also a 10 to 7 night. Anyway, I, would, I would agree regarding the polishing because I guess that your steel is a very is a high strength steel. Almost a high strength. I think that's so maybe another it, problem because there's a um, much higher sensitivity to local effects mm -hmm. from the so. Yes, maybe it can be that, but we are being very careful. But I think that one of the reasons is that we have ultimate strength uh, around 800. But it's not exactly a high, high strength. So I think we are here in the region that we are not exactly, we are not sure if we have, maybe we have more runouts than exactly uh, their uh, region of unit plot. So maybe that's the problem. Thank you. Um, I noticed that you said you'd apply cooling to the, to the specimen. Yes. If you're applying cooling, the outside surface will be cooler than the inside surface if there's a gradient through the surface and therefore there may be tension at uh, the external surface. Have, uh, you, have you taken that into account in either your analysis of the finite element analysis or analysis of the uh, No, we, we haven't. Well, we, for, to be honest, this is a very common procedure for this kind of, it's impossible to perform a ultrasonic test without the cooling. And the, the cooling temperature, we monitor it and is usually around uh, between 25 and, um, and 30. Oh, I mean, we try to uh, maintain it at a room temperature to not have a very radiant temperature. So I think if that's, maybe it's not because of that, but our next step would be to use some camera that can analyze better the temperature distribution. But, but presumably only measure the temperature either outside of the body or on the surface of the body. We measure it by this kind of, these parameters that you can see. that you can see here, and we have two parameters, one in the left and another one in the back, to ensure that we have uh, the temperature that we, we need to have in our space. But of course, maybe the temperature is affecting something because we are only measuring the surface, we are not sure about the temperature in the inside the, the space. But yeah, because, because at relatively low stress level, you won't need much, much delta T to give you a, a tick. A potentially significant thermal stress. Maybe a point to analyze. Thank you. More questions? Maybe I can comment as well. But your question is very interesting. But I have to say that this machine does not work if we have any kind of temperature influence. 
Why? <coughs> because if we have a change on frequency, like, so it works exactly at 20 kilohertz. If we change 100 hertz, it's, uh, uh, it will stop. Uh, and that could happen if uh, the temperature increases, for example, uh, yeah. 40 degrees. So uh, the success of the test depends on the temperature control uh, and the but that's controlled by average temperature, isn't it? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but uh, that's, uh, we are totally open <laughs> because this is a, a topic, as you saw, uh, there are many co uh, uh, conferences today about this topic. This is all topic as well because it starts in the 80s, <laughs> last century. Uh, but uh, now it seems again uh, interesting. But, uh, we are very honest that uh, frequency uh, difference for us is very puzzle. So we don't, we are not happy. So if you have experience on this, please <laughs> we can talk in the coffee break. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Our question. Okay. Uh, did you consider to use any other methods to to measure strain? Um, not the string gauges? No. Not some other? Uh, no. Like, we have, well, we have here this machine apply some displacement. In fact, of course, a, a voltage that is related with a displacement. And we have here a heavy current probe that we can measure the displacement here at the end of our space. So okay, we, but I have in mind something uh, called digital image correlation. Ah, okay. Contactless method or something yes, like that. that because of the velocity of our, uh, because it's where this basement is being tested okay. at 20 kilowatts, so I'm not sure if okay. we can okay. use something like that. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay.